John Prim, welcome to this interview. It's uh, wonderful that we were together as husband and wife participating in this conference at Oak Spring. Yeah. Creating the conference of Living Earth Community with Peter Crane, our former dean. And your specialty being indigenous traditions, especially Native American traditions, we wanted you to start off with talking about cosmovisions, living within a universe, life ways. Can you just fill that out a little bit for us? What, what does that mean, a cosmovision? Thank you. Thank you, Mary Evelyn. It's good to be with you and good to be in this interview series. The, the term life way is the term that I'm quite partial to in studies of indigenous peoples because it's it's often a stand-in substitute for me for the term religion. I find religion carries so much baggage. People have preconceived ideas, uh, doctrines, uh, institutions, even architecture when they think of religion. Whereas Lifeway is trying to raise the question of the, the values and practices associated with religion being woven into the whole of a people's life. And so the, uh, say, a communitarian ethic would be more primary than simply an individual ethic, but rather uh, Lifeway suggests then the seamless character of religious uh, beliefs and practices woven into the economics, the governance, the day-to-day uh, uh, -day activities of the people. And so Lifeway is suggestive of that whole that we find so many uh, indigenous elders when they speak of their sacred ways and sacred sites even, they speak of them as embedded in the whole of a life. And Lifeway then becomes directly related to the term cosmovision, which is uh, now used quite frequently by indigenous elders in gatherings, especially in the American hemisphere, where indigenous elders, when they gather, are trying to emphasize their close relationship with local bioregions, with the local life in a bioregion is not simply boxed in or contained within their, their, that closeness of life in the region, but rather is related to the celestial region. So often many people uh, say they speak of coming from the stars. So that kind of cosmovision is an effort by indigenous peoples to speak of their larger relationships with the whole of life and using Lifeway then that, that those relationships are embedded in the many ways they undertake life. Yes. Does that uh, help? Yes, very much so. So we might say we live within social systems, we family systems, social systems, of communities of um, little cities and then a state and a nation. And we're just trying to restore the notion that we also live in an earth community, right? But yes, I think that's very powerful. For example, we, we speak of governance and our analytical modes, especially in Western thought, but we find this kind of analysis even in other traditional forms of knowing. But the, the governance systems of the West tend to separate out then politics or governance as a sphere unto itself. And we have a challenge when we talk about ethics embedded in that sphere. And certainly I'm trying to suggest that these are powerful ways of knowing that we find in not only Western or dominant societies, but also within indigenous traditions. And I think the, the power of indigenous ways of knowing is that wholeness with, within which they're considering activities such as governance. So this sense of uh, ethical behavior is situated within a larger cosmological frame to it in the sense of how people who are governing or leaders within a tradition, how do they relate to the local bioregion? That's a question, for example, that we wouldn't necessarily bring to our political leaders until lately, when I think we've also begun to realize that the sense of whole is important in our governance systems too. Right, right. Um, well, we could go in a lot of, of directions there of um, understanding ourselves as part of a bio-democracy and that the... Yes. Isn't people. that interesting? Yes. Yeah. Do you want to just say something about the Haudenosaunee people and, and their... Well, the, there's this wonderful text which was done decades ago called A Basic Call to Consciousness. And 
in that text out of the uh, the uh, collection that was called at that time the Agrosastre Notes, uh, that publication talks about the uh, ideas that the Haudenosaunee share with so many indigenous people. One of them now has become very well known again wherever indigenous elders meet and speak in larger polit- uh, public context. The sense of seven generations. It's a very powerful idea. Say Oren Lyons, the Haudenosaunee elder uh, from the specifically the Onondaga peoples, that he would speak of the faces of the children coming up from the earth. And that when governance, when decisions are made by their governance, their longhouse system, they are are very clearly trying to orient themselves into those future generations, making decisions that would be, they would be aware of what's happening in seven generations to the future. So that uh, sense of the Haudenosaunee governance also extends to the development of a uh, Haudenosaunee Environmental Task Force, so a contemporary expression of this uh, biodemocracy that the Haudenosaunee are very clear that they have been committed to in their people's history, that sense namely of how they have interacted related to the local bioregion, and that extends then to their agricultural systems, especially the three sisters of corn, beans, and squash, how they're grown, how the people cultivate that, how they sing up the crops, to use that expression. So biodemocracy has uh, a number of very beautiful expressions among many Native peoples. Yeah, well, let's pick up a few of these, the sense of um, agricultural ritualizing the Three Sisters. Love you to say something about that. And um, other rituals that, that relate to how is a cosmovision lived might be the uh, offering of a child to the cosmos, that ritual as well. But give us a, a few examples of this embedded. Yes, yes that's, a, that's a very in, in, very wonderful question, leading question. The, uh, the Omaha in the ethnology collected in the early 20th century, uh, the Omaha are well known for a ceremonial when they introduce a newborn child to the cosmos. And it's a very beautiful set of prayers in which they hold the child up and the family gathered and those people associated with the families will introduce that child literally to what they're seeing, the sun and the clouds and moving down into the life forms on the earth and into the earth itself. So it's a a lengthy ritual practice of remembering who the people are related to, and they introduce this child. And in that sense, uh, a, a child becomes a person for many indigenous people, not simply when they are born, but rather when they are introduced like that, when they are given a name, when they are presented to all of the earth community and the celestial community. That this uh, underlying idea here of a person the introduction of a child to the cosmos as an acknowledgement that this is a person. We find similar types of ritual practices, introductions or callings or rememberings, say on the uh, Northwest coast, when the Salish people would welcome the salmon when they returned each year, that there were specific forms of rituals that were uh, practiced when the salmon would come down the rivers and streams and, different peoples as they would encounter the salmon coming would address them as the persons and that the salmon are giving of themselves so that they have personhood. They have the capacity of agency to give of themselves and they have even a moral imperative in their arrival in the sense of the migration of the salmon is an ethical statement that they care for the people, they care for the animals because they are feeding the people, they are feeding other animals. So, We find in many traditions these uh, incredibly beautiful and rich ceremonials, which again, I think, is in the larger concept of biodemocracy, of rituals that acknowledge the reciprocal relationship, this, um, this wholeness of receiving from the world and of the human giving back in a responsible way, the respect and reverence for the personhood of life around them. So the living character of reality 
is uh, is emphasized in these rituals. It's practiced in these rituals, acknowledged and lived through these rituals. Wonderful. Uh, thank you. And maybe we could just take that question of ritual to the healing nature of rituals. And perhaps um, I'd love to invite you to talk a little bit about the Sundance and how that bioregion is present in the dance itself. But how, well, how does this affect the community for healing, for restoration, uh, for renewal? Yes, it's such a beautiful question because uh, healing, some people would say, is at the heart of religion. And early on, then, our effort to talk about life way as a term to not eliminate the word religion, but to give it a fuller uh, sense of meaning within the indigenous context. And healing, then, as part of the life way, is embedded in that whole relationship. So in the Sundance ceremonial, and of course that word Sundance is an English term that we use to describe many different ceremonies on the northern and central plains. And the Sundance has now been carried by elders from those traditions even into other continents. And this particular practice, especially on the northern plains, occurs in the early spring, through the spring and into the early summer also. And Individuals who have had a dream or a call to sponsor a Sundance will go to a Sundance leader and that they will initiate the process, which can be a year or even two years in gathering the clan and the community resources in order to hold such a ceremonial. And the, the very quick take on these uh, Sundance ceremonials is that they are a renewal. Healing is, in that sense, a renewal of the bioregion, of the life in the region, of the sites, of the people, of all of this earth community. The dancers, men and women, who vow to go into the lodge, and of course there are different styles of sun dancing on the northern plains where there's a piercing sacrifice or a giving of one's own body to undertake suffering in order to assist this renewal. Also, fasting sun dances, which I'm more familiar with among the Shoshone peoples and Crow or Apsaloke peoples. And these types of ceremonials that undertaken by men and women who go into the lodge to dance barefoot for three, four, five days and to go without food and water, hence the fasting character of the sun dance. They, uh, they undertake these ascetic practices in order to generate the energies associated with uh, hot and cold. And so the, the dancing in this time of year under the hot sun, it's, uh, the dance itself is undertaken in a lodge, which is built uh, on the day the ceremonial begins, a central uh, pillar tree, a sun dance tree, uh, around which uh, the, there are generally set a number 12 in the context of the crow, 12 forked poles with rafter poles that go to the center. So a lodge is built. It would, it's different than the different traditions, say, among the Lakota and uh, among uh, Ute peoples who also Sundance, among Sitsisas or Cheyenne people. So the, the lodge, the reason I'm um, moving towards that side is the lodge itself is seen as alive. And so every structure in that lodge has a name. All of the the central tree and the, the rafters going to the central tree and the 12 outer fork trees on which these rafters sit. And then the shade trees that go on the outside and to give the dancers some shade. The, this lodge that the dancers go into is called in the Crow way, uh, Ashkese. It's the big lodge. It's the cosmic lodge. So the sense of cosmovision is working itself out in the sun dance also one enters into the wholeness of life in these ceremonials and undertakes this fast so as to renew through one's own activity. But it's a concert of people, so it's definitely community-oriented. And the, the dynamics of governance in the ceremonial are also very interesting. There will be healers in the back of the lodge with the sponsor, and then the dancers radiating out to the front with the eastern door, the door always faces to the rising sun. And so the 
drummers who will sing the songs that the dancers will dance to the central tree and back again, that the drummers are a central part of the governance underlying the ceremonial also. At the door, elders will stand and elders will call out, and especially those elders who have the privilege of announcing. So this is a lineage which is transmitted among all of the Northern Plains people, and not, in fact, many indigenous peoples have such a role of those who can talk to the people and tell them what the leadership has decided. And these announcers stand at the door. They're also part of the governance of this particular Sundance ritual. So the healers, the Sundance chief in the back, the dancers, the announcers, the, the uh, drummers, and the women who sing behind the male drummers, and the public outside of the lodge, there's a weave going on of all of these participants in the governance. And this weave then is seen as reaching into the local bioregion. And so there's the sense of, of the people participating by renewing and the, the earth community also giving to the people of itself uh, during the Sundance uh, ceremonial itself. So these exquisite three, four, five day ceremonials on the Northern Plains and as I said elsewhere also are a deep healing for the, the earth community in which the human is situated. Yes, thank you. That's uh, an extraordinary description of an amazing ceremony that's still being kept alive. Uh, we have seen many times the Crow Sundance and the effort um, to do this is immense, as you say, just under the, the heat of the summer day and, and so on but the persistence, the sacrifice, and the sense of renewal of their communities as well as the earth community as a whole is, is astonishing. So let, let's use that as a segue to talk about, um, maybe this would be a concluding uh, piece, but how is it that these traditions, these Native American tribes um, and communities, they've kept alive against great odds their traditions, their ceremonies, their language um, against colonization uh, and, and so on, and the forced taking away of, of language, culture, and religion and land. Um, so what are the challenges right now um, that these communities are facing? I, I'd love you maybe to begin with Standing Rock um, and give us a feeling for what happened at Standing Rock and why is that so important? Yes, yes, thank you for this question because it's, it is imperative when talking about anything related to native peoples in, in, around the planet that we need to acknowledge the history of the encounter and that in itself is a lengthy discussion topic but it it prompts me to say that uh, my remarks are, have always been to engender a sense of respect for the traditions and to understand the difference of peoples, indigenous peoples around the planet and to understand their contemporary voice and to hear that voice. And so your mention of Standing Rock is so important as a concluding comment because we see there this in incredibly uh, important activity generated by youth among the Hunkpapa and Lakota peoples and uh, their development of a camp near the site of a uh, pipeline that was proposed, the Dakota Access Pipeline, and that eventually the larger Hunkpapa community responded. And then the response from indigenous peoples throughout the Americas, one of the largest, if not the largest gathering of Native American representation uh, since uh, earlier times that we were unaware of, uh, this uh, uh, attention at Standing Rock then to an environmental concern is a, is a signal that is given to the environmental movement, broadly speaking, of a way to engage in environmental action that is reaching into the, the home papa tradition and in that sense, the indigenous tradition because we see something similar happening now throughout the American hemisphere and also through around the planet where indigenous people are drawing on their tradition and understanding that what life has given to them, they have committed themselves as a people to standing up 
to protect what has been given to them by the earth community. And so at Standing Rock, we saw these signs, water is medicine and water protectors. And the central concern, the central message that was undertaken in that activity was not simply resistance to a pipeline, but rather an awareness that the pipeline potentially endangered uh, the community of water. It, it endangered what water gave to the community. So from the youth on up, there was this realization that they had to stand up to protect the water. They had to give their voice. Again, we spoke of the seven generations earlier, this consideration of decision-making that will have effect into seven generations. So it's Standing Rock, the sense that they were trying to put water for those who are coming after us. And this we're finding now among so much environmental action among indigenous people, the Wet'suwet'en people in British Columbia, standing up to a pipeline bringing tar sands oil to the west coast of Canada for shipping abroad that the Wet'suwet'en people have had to take on their own government in this regard, and that they are drawing on traditional understanding of protecting the sacredness of their land, the trees, the forests, the water, from pipelines that would rupture. We have no clear assurance that these pipelines can stand up for the time, the temporal considerations that these people are talking about. So uh, this environmental activity, the environmental focus of indigenous people is a tremendous turn now. It's a, a pivoting moment at which the, the environmental community and the dominant culture is beginning to see a new ways of understanding this uh, the animate character of the earth that we need to understand and stand up for that which we interrelate with, which we depend upon, and which gives us life. So I think we will see much more of this in the environmental community, a sense of the biodemocracy, to use that term, the sense of the living character of the earth community that we stand in solidarity with, rather than simply resisting technological projects. We want to ask the question, how will these projects affect life into the future? Thank you. That's a great conclusion um, to this discussion. And maybe I'll just mention to conclude that um, in the gathering of 30,000 people in Cochabamba in Bolivia several yeah. years ago to draft the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Nature, um, that is also an example of this articulation of the living earth community. Wonderful, and yes. And the co term cosmovision being exactly. used in that context. Exactly. And that document reaching all the way to the floor of the UN, because the General Assembly president happened to be from Venezuela and brought that to the UN, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth, and it was voted upon and approved. So there's many challenges, um, but some extraordinary, um, courageous examples of, of resistance uh, to environmental destruction. And yes. the new articulation of mother. and in that sense, also the burgeoning sense of earth rights of wild law. I think it's connected very much to the example you've given, also of water, the sense of the rights of water. But here we need not so much a, a legal language, but a new type of a spiritual or a, a lifeway language, uh, seeing the the inherent uh, personhood, the inherent sovereignty of the waterways and of the soil ways. Right. Well, thank you. We could continue for a long time on this, but um, that was very uh, wonderful and thank you. Thank John. you. Thanks.